All right, welcome, welcome to a cope topics with the professor. Uh, first and foremost, I'm gonna thank you for showing up and showing out, tapping in with me. Um, we gonna get these tarot correspondences cracking. Um, if you're new, <clears throat> sliding through, you're just watching me study, sharing my insights. Um, this has actually been a very interesting journey for me because I'm used to studying inside my head. So uh, hearing myself read and study and things like that has really helped me out. And I think that has been why this Tarot Correspondence course has had such an impact on my, uh, my consciousness and my dreams is because I'm actually doing something very different I'm absorbing the information differently because normally it's all in my head. Any connections I make is like an aha moment, light bulb comes on, I might scribble a note. So I'm noticing some very good changes in my study habits. Number one, uh, I'm not highlighting everything like I normally do. And number two, I'm realizing also that the not highlighting it just dawned on me that that's an encouragement that I'm going to be back. I'm, I'm digesting this information a lot slower, which I don't think is a bad thing, you know, as opposed to rushing to make my mind up on certain topics. So before we go any further, I'm going to thank you again for tapping in. Thank you for your time because I recognize your time as the ultimate sacrifice and you're choosing to lay some of that time on the altar of knowledge so we can learn together um, I've said it before, I'll say it again. Uh, I kind of make these videos, reading out of different books for the serious readers who have jobs or anything where you, you're on YouTube and you can listen, but not look. Because I used to be at work, still, and I used to be, I'm at work and I'm looking for something that's informative, something I can learn. But I'm moving and grooving. I'm definitely not looking at my at my phone, and I need something to write out to for an hour or two or longer. So I realized that I could share these study sessions and hopefully provide for somebody who's like me who'd be out there looking for something on Tarot. And all these videos are nine minutes, six minutes, uh, one minute. You're lucky if you get a twenty minute, right? And even then. You might find somebody with some bomb information for an hour and you might have to just keep replaying that same one. So uh, here you'll find them, you know, two and a half, three hours. So hopefully uh, this is uh, scratching the itch for somebody. So having said that, in the background, I got a, uh, in the background, I'm playing these binaural beats. Uh, let me turn it down a little bit. It's a, uh, some of the topic, I believe, meditation, Satan or satanic meditation, but it's binaural beats. Don't let the title fool you. These have actually been um, the best binaural beats to meditate to, study to, uh, zone out to. Um, and I think that the title was appropriate because it kind of it kind of like. Uh, keeps out the unworthy. You shall not pause. Because if you're scared of the word sedation, uh, uh, satanic and in combination with binaural and meditation, then it's not for you. Uh, what, what I find odd is that I share my, my YouTube with my wife and son. My wife, uh, I say share my YouTube because I got premium. I don't want no commercials. Uh, you know, I want to be able to turn my phone off and still listen. I don't know if you don't got to pay for that anymore, but I do. I have the YouTube premium. So uh, my son is logged in and my wife is. My kids have their own. And it's funny because uh, every now and then my wife would be like, what is this stuff you be looking up? You know, so get that. And then on a, on a more... I say not so much funny, but just like a good note, man. And I catch my son listening to lectures and uh, uh, shoot, he constantly listens to Dream Wise, uh, D Ray Wise, uh, Travis Majors. He, you know, 
he rock with what I rock with, mainly because it's in the it's in the search history. But hey, you know, have at it. So you know, there's some good and some positive. But again, uh, I believe it is. Let me let me click on it. Yeah, uh, satanic meditation, uh, Astaroth Star. I believe the person who put it up, his name is like Charles Xavier Schomburg. There's like seven videos, different links. Um, I actually took some down. I've been listening to this. I've been listening to these particular set of videos for at least seven years now. He's taken some down. I don't know why. But uh, again, it's good by North Beach. So let's dive in. What I want to do today. Oh, clearly we're on the Hermit 9. Uh, before we get to reading the actual information on this particular card, I kind of wanted to just start decoding some of the symbols that, that's plain to see. And then as I read, I'll see what, you know, what I kind of hit on, what I didn't, and take it from there. Now, uh, as I am accustomed to doing, I like to present the uh, builders of the Aditium card, the Volta, Paul, Dr. Paul Foster Case card, which is on the left. And then the Rider Wade Smith card, which is on the right. Um, the differences are like night and day, clearly. And um, I lean towards the uh, uh, Bolta decks, the Paul Foster case. However, I am beginning to appreciate some of the subtleties and sublime nature of the Rider right Wade right away decks. Uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, Arthur Edward Waite, he's going to make you work for every dime. And even then, as you're working, he might send you down a dark alley and you have to double back. But again, he's making you work. And if you if you are, uh, you know, like any any good movie, I was going to say, if you are, if you persevere enough, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll find out where the blinds and the dead ends are. And, you know, like any hero movie, the hero has to undergo all these challenges and, you know, hero's journey, right? But still, I, I am beginning to appreciate it more. So I want to decode some of these symbols just visually off rip. His robes appear to be gray. He has a white beard. Uh, gray, gray would imply equilibrium because on the, the two pillars, Boaz being black, Jachin being white, the synthesis, the equilibrium, the middle path, the mildness would be a, a sort of gray. But that 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 gray robe is like kind of highlighted black. It's like it's tinged black. I don't see any uh usually when you see that kind of shading. I'm looking at the right away deck. Usually when you see that kind of shading, there's gonna be some kind of word or some blended in, which I'm pretty sure it is. Uh the white beard would suggest age, wisdom, you know, uh, maturity, fatherhood, and then old age. Definitely not youth or manhood, right? This would, you know, this is a full father time type beard. Um, he has the staff in his left hand. He has the lantern in his right. The lantern in both images are. Uh, Oh, I just caught some in the, in the, uh, the weight deck. The Hebrew, the Hebrew, the Hebrew letter associated with the hermit card. That is actually that blue skull cap on his head, which is dope. Um, the star inside appears to be a six point star. I see that while he has a staff in his hand, which is for walking. Staff is a wand. Wand is fire. Fire is illumination. A upright character, upright man. Uh, he has that star, six point star, and uh, but he appears to be not sleep but like in deep contemplation and meditation. So, the difference I see in both cards immediately is that one is more vibrant, uh, the shoes are brown on the bolted deck. It's an all solid gray on the right of weight. The background is all black in the bolted deck. It's all blue on the weight deck. And then the, and the bottom right corner, I don't know if that's a signature or what on the weight card. Because I have my actual, uh, 
I have my actual hermit card right here, that that symbol, that sigil, whatever, is still there in both. So I'm gonna have to read his uh, rates book to see what 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 if he speaks on it. But I'm pretty sure by the time I get to Robert Wayne, if Paul Foster Case doesn't speak on it, I'm pretty sure Robert Wayne will. Uh, the background is uh, looks rocky or mountainous, barren. So he's clearly in seclusion. And that's about all I can see. Oh, now with his head bowed, like I said, I think that's meditation, contemplation. But I find it, I find the contrast odd that he has light to see, a staff of fire, a, so an upright spine, the spinal column, enlightenment, and then he has his eyes closed. So clearly that uh that lantern is not for him to see outwardly. Pretty sure it's representing a, an inward reflection. So Let's decode some of these symbols, and then we're going to get into the actual information. So I think first, the most obvious I'm going to look up is that robe he's rocking. Let's see what it says about robes. Oh, and I'm going to J.C. Cooper's and Illustrated Encyclopedia Symbols, which is like really my first go-to. Anybody rock with me, you know, if I'm looking for something, I'm going to go to this book first. I just want to see what he has to say about robes. What they signify. Bobo, bobo, dang, 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 dang. Okay, here's the robe. Chinese. The imperial and official robe presented a symbolism of the entire universe, its perfection, and the power of heaven and the emperor as its earthly representative. The symbols varied between the Taoists and the Buddhists, but the shape of the robe was also symbolic as the roundness of the sleeves depicted elegance of manners, the straightness of the seams signified incorruptibility in administering justice, the lower edge portrayed the horizontal position of the beam of the balance and firmness of will and calmness of heart, Christian, and this is most likely going to apply. The purple robe depicts Christ's passion, the white robe innocence or triumph of, of the spirit over flesh, the seamless robe depicts the passion, also charity, unity, mithraic, the robe of the mysteries or initiate or the sign of the zodiac and in donning it, the initiate became the God passing through the constellation. All right, I can rock with that. Look up colors real quick. Um, let's see. Colors. Where is gray? The neutral, mourning, depression, ashes, humility, pen penitence, Christian. Death of the body and immortality of the soul. I think that is the most applicable to this, this setting in this color gray. Born by religious communities, Hebrew, Kabbalism, wisdom. Again, that applies most definitely. And then Islamic, oh, no, 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 no. Wisdom and then heraldic tribulation. Um, let's look at the background. The bolted background is blue. Truth, the intellect, revelation, wisdom, loyalty, fidelity, consistency, chastity, chaste affections, <clears throat> spotless reputation. Magnanimity, prudence, piety, peace, contemplation, coolness. Blue is the color of the great deep. Blue is also the color of Jupiter now. Mm -hmm. The feminine principle of the waters as sky blue is the color of the great mother. That's closer to a sky blue. Queen of heaven and all the sky gods or sky powers such as the azure dragon. Is also the void, primordial, primordial simplicity and infinite space, which being empty can contain everything. Uh, it is also a lunar color. You see all the great mother references, so that it being lunar is not a stretch. Buddhist, the coolness of the heavens above and the waters below, wisdom, the wisdom of Dharma Datu, Celtic and Druidic, a bard or poet, Chinese, the heavens, clouds, the azure dragons of the east, spring, wood, Christian. Um, sorry. Christian, heaven, heavenly truth, eternity, faith, fidelity, 
the color of the Virgin Mary is queen of heaven, Gnostic, baptism by water, Greco-Roman, attributed a tribute of Zeus, Jupiter, and Hera Juno as sky deities. We just discussed that. Also the color of Venus. Now I've only known Venus to be the color blue, I mean green, but I rock with that. Hebrew, Kabbalism, mercy. So it all, this definitely, even though he has on gray robes, which, which, which would suggest malness equilibrium, clearly the hermit is on the path of uh, the pillar of mercy. I'm pretty sure when we get to Robert Wayne, we'll get some more elucidation on that. <clears throat> and then um, Hindu, the blue rain cloak of Indra, Mayan, defeat of an enemy. I do want to go look at the uh, bolted deck. And let's go to black. Now, the void was mentioned with the color blue. I'm going to bet you that black is also going to be uh, tied into the visoid. Black, primordial darkness, the non-manifest, the void, evil, darkness of death, shame, despair, destruction, corrupt, grief, sadness, humiliation, renunciation, gravity, cons constancy. And that was also uh, one of the attributes of color blue. Black also signifies time. Now, the time aspect, the hermit very much looks like Father Time. That, that lantern could easily be an hourglass. Uh, hard, pitiless, and irrational, and is associated with the dark aspect of the Great Mother. So the blue and black does line up with the Great Mother aspect. Um, especially as Kali, who is Kala, time, and with on oh, time. So the Paul Foster deck, the Paul Paul Foster case, the uh, Hermit cars. Uh, is showing that connection to Father Time. Um, with black virgins, black or blue black is the color of chaos. Um, in the Occident, <clears throat> black is connected with mourning and with the sinister aspect of witchcraft, black magic, black arts. It is the color of Kronos, Saturn, so that Father Time. So that's what he's emphasizing. Whereas in the right away deck, he's emphasizing the sky deities, the mother goddess, uh, Hera, Juno, Zeus, Jupiter, whereas the Paul Foster case deck is emphasizing um, the, the dark side of the great mother, or no, not so much dark side, the time, the temporal aspect, I would say. So that temporal aspect would be uh, Dina, Saturn, Black cube, which is probably why it's black. Okay, I can rock with that. I can only really rock with it. Um, and the number eight. This is the ninth card. I'm pretty sure if we put out all of the eights in the decks, eight of swords, eight of cups, eight of pentacles, and uh, Eight of Wands, we will see that connection. Maybe we will if we got the time. Uh, alchemic, the absence of color, the first stage of the great work, dissolution, fermentation, the sinister, descent into hell. I, I like the fact that, now if you've been rocking with me, you know that normally I play either Ganesh or Kali in the background. I chose the satanic meditation, the binaural beats. This, this it's not darker, but right now I am looking at a huge image of Baphomet with the yod hey vol hey around the points. Hmm. Let me think about that. Hmm, that's dope. But yeah, I see I'm I'm synchronized. And I want to say this before I move on. Um 
I've reached a point where synchronicity has faded into the background for me. I don't, um, I really, I rarely acknowledge them. I get them so often, but I rarely even stop to be like, oh damn, I just said this and that. I will every now and then, but <clears throat> for me, the synchronicities come so frequently and so rapid fire that I, I tip my hat to them and keep moving. For me, it's more like, uh, like a blind man that has his house set up where he knows where he's at. So he can reach over, feel this, or kind of on there, reach over, feel this, reach above, feel that. So for me, it doesn't stop me from moving. It just lets me know that I'm actually where I need to be. Let me fire up some more incense real quick. Oh. All right, man, I was stressing, I was stressing about the fact that the place I normally get my incense from had uh, went out of business. And I was like, man, where am I gonna get my instance from? I went down and keeping it real, uh, I was rocking, I was watching one of the Travis Majors videos. Um, he's reading the uh Dion Fortune, Mystical Kabbalah. And he was like, Man, I go right to the corner store, to the Arab store, the Indian store, and I buy the Nam Choppers that they have here. And I'm thinking, they do have the Nam Chop Nam Choppers there. So I went and uh and that's where I read up at. So I got some good ones. This one right here is uh, some kind of frankincense and myrrh. There was another one called spiritual aura, tree of life, and another one. It was four. I bought one of each, $1.83 a piece. So, you know, before I was taking this nice little trip, uh, driving like 20-something minutes, 25 minutes to go get my incense, which they had a lot more variety. Uh, better deals, and you know, you get your crystals and any other spiritual tools you need. Still, it was working out for me. Oh, and I didn't speak on it, man. I'm rocking my uh, my my chaotic tea. I healed myself with my just the chaotic uh, peach, chaotic uh, tea. Uh, Kamara, shout out to uh, Dreamwise and his queen. This is that uh, I healed myself with peach soda, Bobby Hemet. Shout out to the to Uncle Bobby. So we were reading about the color black. Let's get back to that. And what I can say too, before I go any further, what I do know already before even diving in is that the hermit card uh, is synchronous to Virgo. And outwardly, I would just say because it's the ninth card. September's the ninth month. So I don't know. We'll see. Uh, Buddhist, the darkness of bondage. Chinese, the north, yin, water, winter. The tortoise among the four spiritually endowed animals. Christian, the prince of darkness. Hell, death, sorrow, mourning, humiliation, spiritual darkness, despair, corruption, evil, arts. It is the color used for masses for, dead, for the dead and Good Friday. Egyptian, rebirth and resurrection. Man, you see how negative the color black is for Christians, and you wonder why a certain group of people constantly catch hell here in America. Um, Hebrew, Kabbalism, understanding the kingdom, heraldic, prudence, wisdom, Hindu, the oh, Tamas. Oh, and Hindu, black is Tamas. Uh, sensual, downward movement, time, the dark aspect of Kali Durga, Mayan death of enemy. So the Hindu aspect is prevalent here because the same Hindu uh, deities mentioned in the right of weight were mentioned in the Bota. Because remember, Hindu deities are primarily uh, blue-black to symbolize chaos, XYZ. So let's look up the lantern. 
And I'm gonna go to the other book on symbols I have. I want I don't want to linger too long on this, but I, I kind of want to change it up and look up these symbols out the gate. And then while that's marinating into my subconscious, uh, I do the reading and make my connections that way. Lamp. Okay, life, the light of divinity, immortality, wisdom, the intellect, guidance, the stars, also individual life in its transitory, tra transitoriness, transitoriness, good works, shedding light and darkness, remembrance, the seven lamps of Christianity are the seven gifts of the spirit. The lamp is the emblem of S.S. Agatha, Bridget, Cadula, Genevieve, Hugh, Hildrutus, Lucy, Nihilus, Lamps on altars indicate the light of the presence of divinity. They can also be used as a substitute for the sun in sun or fire worship. A lot of fire represented here from the, from the staff to the actual fire. So it's actually being emphasized, right? And I just something just crossed my mind that staff being on the ground is showing uh, an aspect of your, your illumination being grounded or in the process of being grounded. In Hinduism, the oil of the lamp is the ocean and devotion. The wick is the earth and mind. The flame is love. Well, that's dope. And what I want to do is shoot over to Barbara G. Walker's book down. Uh, Barbara G. Walker's The Woman's Dictionary of Symbols and Sacred Objects. I want to look up this six-pointed uh, star. That's the only thing I don't like. I don't uh, think in this book, I don't think she has like a, she doesn't, she doesn't have like a table of contents. I'm looking for six-pointed motifs. Let me see if I can find it. C sixty eight. That's it. Oh, sure he is. Let's see all these different objects. Sixty eight five points. And this is six star. Fixed star. Oh, the magic hexagram is actually. The six point star. I'm tripping. Six point star, star David after Mercaba. Slow today, y'all. So here we have the hexagram, which is a six point star, which is encased in that lamp. Though now widely accepted as the emblem of Judaism and given such names as Megan David, Star of David, Solomon Seal, the hexagram has been officially Jewish for only about a century. At the time that stories about David and Solomon were being written in the Bible, the hexagram had nothing to do with either of them. It was then revered in India as a symbol of the perpetual sexual union between Kali, the downward pointing triangle, and Shiva, the upward pointing triangle. That was supposed to maintain life in the universe. The hexagram reached Judaism by a devious route. Passing through the tantric influence of medieval Jewish Kabbalists who spoke of the desired union between God and his spouse, the Shekinah, a Semitic version of Kali Shakti. This union was symbolized by the tantric sexual mandala. Hence, the curious rabbinical tradition that the Ark of the Covenant contained not only the tablets of the law, but also a man and a woman in intimate embrace in the form of a hexagram. In India, the male-female union also meant a union of the elements of fire and water, which were considered respectively male and female. So the hexagram also meant fertilization of the primordial, primordial female deep by fire from heaven, the phallic lightning. In alchemy, the same symbol meant alcohol, fire water. That makes, I never thought about alcohol. The natives called it fire water as it being a contrast. And that makes perfect sense. People drink alcohol to turn up, but alcohol is actually a depressant. Um, 
it brings you down. Alcohol is actually initially, it was uh, in America, at least alcohol was initially used as a battlefield sedative, something that you could do or take while they sawed off one of your limbs. You know what I'm saying? So I never thought of the, the, the dichotomy of fire water. And alchemy, the same symbol meant alcohol, fire water, based on the belief that alcohol was water, somehow infused with heat. The hexagram appeared also in the New World at Uxmal in Yucatan. It is the symbol of the sun shedding its rays on earth. Hmm. You know what I want to do? I moved on too fast from uh, J.C. Cooper's Illustrated and Illustrated Psychopedia Symbols. I forgot to look up the staff. And while I'm here, I'll look up uh, staff, masculine power, authority, the, the, uh, dignity, magic power, journey, pilgrimage. It is, a, it is also a solar and axial symbol. The staff or crook is an attribute of all good shepherds, Buddhists, law and order, a symbol of Buddha's mace, i.e. his teaching. Christian, Christ as God, the shepherd, pilgrimage. The staff with rings denotes Episcopal power and authority. The staff born before high dignitaries depicts the dignity of office. In the left hand, which is where he's holding his, the staff signifies cardinals, archbishops, bishops, abbots, and abbesses. I guess the female abbess. Abbot. The staff of pilgrimage is an emblem of St. James the Great. John the Baptist, Jerome, Christopher, Philip the Apostle, Apostle, and Ursula. The building, the budding staff is an emblem of Saints Etherelda and Joseph of Arimathea, uh, Egyptian. The staff and the flail are the chief attributes of Osiris as judge of the dead. The staff with the pen depicts the soul awakening and is an attribute of the Ut or the Logos or Logois. Uh, Greco-Roman, the herald staff as the caduceus is the chief attribute of Hermes slash Mercury. Uh, so we could also say, even though it's not the staff, the caduceus, there's a, clearly there's a connection between the hermit card, the fool, and Mercury. The three combined sticks of the staff of uh, Vaishnava tradition symbolize the three realities or the three gunas. The three gunas con constituting the phenomenal world or the control of thought, word, and deed of the saint or sage. The three gunas. Now, I've been rocking with, rock, with Travis Majors too long not to know. I believe that's Raja Safas, Sa Raja Safa Thomas. Cat going cray cray. I used to think that when I did these videos late at night, he was bouncing around, jumping off shit because I was invading space. Uh, I don't think that anymore. Because normally when I'm not here, he's in my room sleep. He's not even in here. But again, me talking and bumping my gums could be interfering with his restful time, which I may just close the door and lock him up in the room. I'm letting him do his thing. Um... Yeah, so I was right. Rogers, Sattva, and Thomas. That's the three gunas. So there's a connection between the staff and three gunas. Uh oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see if she has anything. Um, yep. He just earned himself. Uh, a little lightweight incarceration. For a cat that has the name Tasmanian Devil, he sure didn't like this last binaural beat.
This is actually a fire image. It says, um, nimble tall is freedom. I don't know what nimble tall means. N-E-M-B-U-T-A-L is freedom, but it has the five point star with the point facing down. In the center is an ankh. At the very bottom is a Celtic cross. Uh, going around clockwise from the Celtic cross, we have the uh, that iron cross, like the one that you saw like on Nazi symbols, a little, or bike, bikers wear it. Then going up to the next point, there's the ohm symbol. Go around further, there's the hexagram that we're reading about right now. And then even further down to the last point is the crescent moon and star. That's pretty dope. That is pretty dope. Um, oh, I want to see if she had anything in here on the lamp. Or oh, the lantern. That might be too loud. Let me turn down the taste. Drizzle. Let's see what she has to say about the lamp. This is Barbara G. Walker's uh, The Woman's Dictionary of Symbols and Sacred Objects. Um, Aladdin's lamp had plenty of counterparts in folklore and occultism. A lamp was an almost universal symbol of enlightenment as it is to this day. Light in the darkness was also a charm of creation of birth under the rule of Juno Lucina or Diana Lucifera, bringers of light to the newborn. Man, I'm getting a lot of synchronicities on my choice of music in this car. Um, the old idea was copied by the biblical god Fiat Lux, let there be light. Uh, that's my translation, Fiat Lux, let there be light. A popular magic lamp story concerning the tomb of Cicero's daughter, Tulia. When her tomb was unsealed, it was found to contain not only Tulia's body, but also a miraculous lamp that had been burning continuously for centuries. An early version of the tale of the eternal flame. A similar perpetual lamp was supposed, now I finna say, the Rosicrucian dude, was supposed to be to illuminate the sealed tomb of Christian Rosicruz, alleged found in Rosicrucians. Many ancient terracotta lamps were given distinctly female genitalia shapes. The orifice for the wick was placed in the position of the clitoris, cited as the focus of sexual fire. The enlightenment associated with such lamps may have been linked with mystical knowledge that the ancients attributed to sexual experiences with priestesses of the goddess. That was dope, that was dope. Let's see what she has to say about the staff. Bobo QR. See, this could be a whole study of itself, just looking at all the symbols. So I'm not gonna get too caught up. She doesn't have staff in there. I'm gonna let that be my cue to move on. Let's get this study going. And we're gonna kick it off with, I gotta do one more. Let's look at the G.A. Gaskill Dictionary of All Scriptures and Myths. Not a cheap book, but a very useful tool. A very useful tool. A hermit, hermit or anchorite, a symbol of an ego manifesting in the center of consciousness on the sixth mental subplane. When a householder sees his skin wrinkled and his hair white and the sons of his sons, then abandoning all food raised by cultivation, we can see the lack of cultivation by the mountains and all his belongings, he may depart into the forest, either committing his either committing his wife to his sons or accompanied by her. When an ego through the individuality householder perceives that his lower nature skin has fallen away and that he is gifted with pure intuition, white hair, the higher and higher mental qualities, sons of sons, 
Then he turns away from seeking knowledge, food, through experience and discipline and gives up his lower mental faculties. He is thus prepared to withdraw from all externals into the solitude forest of his soul, leaving the emotion nature with the mental qualities and uniting with the Buddhic principle, wife. Buddha laid aside weapons and, and pondered the satra. He practiced perfect calm and underwent various observances like a hermit and refused all objects of sense. He viewed all his kingdoms like a father. The soul now casts aside its weapons of offense, defense, that is, it relinquishes its outgoing energies and relies upon the word of the Lord, which is the expression of the supreme within it. That which unifies and coordinates its experiences. The soul realizes itself as a centrally situated and as the soul realizes itself as centrally situated and meditates within itself. And then it undergoes many acts of self-discipline as an anchorite. I think that's what the staff was referring to, the anchorite being grounded. It withdraws from the many and regards all precipitations equally and dispassionately as a father as, as a father, his children. Now I will say this, hermit, anchor, seclusion, pulling away from cultivation. You've seen in G.A. Gaskill's book, all of these are symbolic. You do not have to embody the hermit by withdrawing from civilization, abandoning your kids and wife and responsibilities, not eating food. You know, food represents knowledge, uh, you know, and so on, so on, as he said. So I thought that was pretty dope. So let's go to Philip Cooper, Teach Yourself to Roll the Quick and Easy Way. We are looking for the Hermite, Hermit, Hermiticus, Eviticus. All right, the Hermit synopsis, a time to stand alone, soul searching, establishing one's own identity. General description, a Hermit represents the soul in search of spiritual perfection. For everyone, there is a time to stand alone and look within to seek inner guidance before proceeding. A hooded figure clothed completely in black stands holding a lantern and a staff. The ground is covered with snow. Oh, that's snow. That's the peaks of the mountain. That's, so he's truly within. Um, something he said that I want to speak on. The hermit represents the soul in search of spiritual, spiritual perfection. For everyone, there's a time to stand alone. I think it's the meditation aspect, the going within. Actually, to be honest, I was supposed to go, I was going to do a video before this one speaking on meditation. You know, uh, how to, what to expect, um, uh, how do you know if you're in that sweet spot or if you're just imagining, matter of fact, I'm gonna do it right now uh, because the synchronicities are too much. And this is what I'm here for, right? To elucidate, not so much for anybody who happens to be listening, but more so, more so for myself. So meditation, and I won't take long. Um, the purpose of meditation is to go within. I know that might seem, that might seem like duh, but um, the act of, of meditation, of going within, going within, one of the first things that I noticed when I began to meditate regularly is that meditation allows you to slow everything down around you. Um, when you draw your awareness in, it's like you actually remove yourself from, I won't say so much space, but definitely time right and even space i'm gonna be honest because you can have a meditation and it will feel as though you actually went somewhere even though your physical body didn't but again uh your physical body body is an illusion so to say that it didn't travel somewhere phase into another dimension uh that's for another discussion but 
meditation does have that benefit of slowing things down and giving you a, a better perspective, a bird's eye view. Um, the reasons for meditating are nearly endless. You can meditate for self-healing, for enlightenment. Um, you can you can meditate for uh, prosperity, manifesting. Um, a real good thing to do with uh, meditation in terms of manifestation is you go into meditation and you see yourself doing whatever it is you do. I mean, not even for manifesting money. That's a good thing to do. Like if you think you hate your job, then you go in meditation and you see yourself navigating all those things you hate with ease. Like I never did mind the little things, you know, but meditation serves a lot of purposes. Like I said, health, manifestation, knowledge, wisdom, understanding, um, uh, majority of these are going to be applied internally but they also apply externally as well just you'll find that the more you get in the practice of meditating and regularly you actually begin to change those closest to you first you change then those in your immediate vicinity begin to change and i found just by cultivating this uh the art and practice of meditation you'll find that you attract different things just in your day to day, you know. I was recently on Rob Blackstone's uh, platform on YouTube and somebody asked me uh, about dreams and uh, a lot of people said, now don't dream or I don't remember my dreams. Well, and then so they asked me, what's one of the steps to uh, recalling dreams, remembering dreams? But one of those steps is meditate every day and you write down whatever you experience in meditation as if it was a dream. And that kind of bridges that gap between not recalling dreams and then telling that part of your unconscious or subconscious mind, hey, I do want to remember my dreams. I want to recall. But a, a big part of it too, talking dreams now, is you have to literally convince yourself that I don't forget my dreams. I remember, you know, I, that's, that's it and that's all. But in terms of meditation, um, one of the best techniques I learned was from Philip Cooper's Magician. And in that book, he broke down like a meditation technique where it allows you to establish a pattern that will automatically lower your body into that, that trance-like state quicker. And so what that means is you go into meditation and then you have a, a route and a destination that you go to, that you've created. And in the process of going there, you don't speed it up. So like I'll describe briefly, okay, let me say it first that I describe what I do. So you have this place that you go to then you have a route then you take the route and you know, and then you you get there however you however you choose to get there. Some people just pop up and go straight there. I, over time, I developed a route, and I take a route where I walk this way. Number one, my unconscious and subconscious mind knows when we see this, oh, we're going we're going to that place. So I immediately immediately gets me into that trance like state into that zone. And then once I get there to the to the place, I've already I've erected my sacred space is like a temple now it doesn't have to be something you just built it could be your grandma's house it could be your childhood house it could be somewhere you went that you have very good feelings about but it has to be somewhere you you can recall in as much detail as possible you can always add to it you can always take away from it but it has to be something that you can see in great detail now inside here you have all your magical tools all your workings anything you might do actually you you you, you actually have what Jesus said, my father's, my father's house has many mansions. You got a, a house with endless number of rooms and hallways, shit to discover and do. So when you do go, this is another way, the house, the sacred space represents your mind. Going down the hallways, going in different doors represents accessing different parts of your, your consciousness, your unconscious and subconscious mind. Feel me? So in mines, I had like a temple. It's more of a ziggurat. Um, 
my the route that I take to get there. Um, I always come in like on the side of the road and I'm heading uh, for lack of a better word, most likely north or east. I don't know. But I'm heading in this direction always the same way. There's usually a trickle of people coming towards me. And as the trickle of people, and oh, let me say this is important. Walking on this dirt road, I have on like these little robes. Like I said, I, you do it so much, things begin to kick in and it just becomes what it is. Uh, most of the times when you first start, you're not even going to think about what you have on. But if you do it enough, eventually you'll be, you'll wonder, what am I wearing? You'll look down and see what you have on. I wear these like beige robes, like Jedi robes, like Obi-Wan Kenobi or Qui-Gon Jinn robes. It's a real light color. Uh, walking down a dirt road to my left and right, it's like wheat. It's like really tall grass, but it's golden, really tall, to where I can just drop my hands and, and brush across the tops of the grass. And um, as the people coming towards me begin to go to a trickle, and then there's none, I always veer off the beaten path, cut through the grass, and I immediately start shedding the robes, taking all my clothes off, kick off my sandals. Then I'll come to a tree. I used to have, initially I had a sigil that I would draw on this tree, and the tree would open up, boom, 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 boom turn to a portal. I'd go into the portal, get to where I'm going. Um, Prior to the tree, let me speak on the evolution of consistent meditation. Prior to the tree, I go through all these trials and tribulations to get to my temple. I would go up this mountain on the top of the, at, at, at this certain point in the mountain, at a certain point going up, the, the, the walkway got real narrow. I would write, the, it was windy and cold. I would write the sigil and then go in. And it took going over my meditations because like I said, I write, I write down, I used to, I don't do it anymore, but I used to write down my meditations like a dream. So it was like a dream recall, like a dream journal. I had a meditation journal and I would go over meditation journal every 45 days to two months. And it took a while for me to recognize why is it so torturous to get to my sacred space? And so that's when I cut out, I consciously cut out that part it ain't that hard getting to where I'm trying to go. That's the message I'm telling to myself. And so that's when, uh, instead of me walking down this path and the golden flowers going up this rocky cold mountain, um, I walked up to the nearest tree, drew that sigil on it. It opened up, took me right to where I was going. So that showed an evolution in my process, not just in getting to my sacred space, but in me cutting to the chase and me getting to the good part, uh, and not so much right away because there's no rush. You, the point in the, and taking this travel and taking this route and going here and drawing sigils on rocks and trees is you are allowing your physical body to go to sleep while your conscious mind remains awake. So that's what makes it so much like a lucid dream is because your body is essentially in a trance and your conscious mind is fully working and activated. Um, and so, yeah, uh, another thing I wanted to say was that, um, just to back it up a little bit, because I said something that I thought about. You want to, the ability to put yourself in that trance-like state, it's going to be different for everybody. You can watch, you can watch a Deepak Chopra uh, video. And a lot of them tell you to, release the tension from every part of your body you know, start at the top of your head go to your ears count to two release the tension go to your nose count to three release the tension go to your shoulders go to your elbows go to your fingers and you release them um that works for some might not work for others but at least try it if you're new to this try it if you try it enough and try doesn't mean you do it once to say it doesn't work try it means give it at least a week Meditate once a day, twice a day, three times a day, trying this technique. If it doesn't work, because yeah, remember, as a researcher, as a person on this occult path, you are a scientist. A scientist doesn't just attempt one thing and uh, wrap it up. So if you're trying these different methods, uh, only thing you should be changing up is location, time, mindset, uh, setting. Settings such as incense, whether you want 
take a shot of alcohol, hit the weed, uh, smoke a cigarette, uh, eat, eat your favorite, and eat some lasagna, whatever it is that gets you in that space. For me, what I realized quickly was what gets me in that space outside of being on public transportation. I can be on public transportation no matter how rested I am, I will move. I won't go on meditation. I'll begin to astral project or at the very least lose a drink. And I don't like that because you got so many weirdos around you. But yeah, I can go in immediately on some public transportation. But what I learned about myself was, and this is the hack, is that I learned that I realized that meditation involves either an excess of oxygen or a lack of. Not so much asphyxiation, but like denying yourself oxygen, which is why uh, the breathing techniques are important prior to meditation. I would actually charge because prana, breath, spirit, uh, is a, breathing techniques are a way of charging your etheric body and your astral body, so on and so forth. So I would practice... Uh, different breathing exercises where you might walk up from one to four, breathe in for one second, hold for one second, excel for one second, hold for one second, repeat. Uh, it's definitely something you wanna work up to if you haven't done before, because Americans are such shallow breathers, you might be surprised that you cannot even inhale for more than four or five seconds straight. Some people it's like that. Uh, you might have to work up, build up your lung capacity because eventually you do want to experiment and try taking deeper breaths, holding it longer, exhaling it longer because if you inhale for 10 seconds, you should be able to hold it for 10 seconds. Ex exhale for 10 seconds hold for 10 seconds and then your next breath but what this does is believe it or not it is a form of hyper oxygen oxygenization i'm not sure if that's the word or probably made it up but it's a way of giving your body too much oxygen which will place you in a hallucinogenic state or of denying your yourself oxygen which will equally put you in a hallucinogenic state so just saying that and then um Whenever you meditate, if you're a newbie, if you're new to it, it's okay to go in just to look around, play, experience, and have fun. The more consistent you are with it, then you'll realize it's time to get down to work because you've actually discovered something that is awesome, terrifying, all that good stuff. But it's, it's a tool. It's not a couch. It's not something you use just to sit on and go to sleep and go to work and tell your coworkers, yeah, I meditated today. Actually, I found myself in a position where I actually became addicted to meditating. I say addicted because I was easily meditating every chance I got. Uh, as soon as I woke up, I get to work an hour early, meditate. Uh, you know, um, I like at the time, I liked meditating in my car, which I still do. I like meditating in my car, so I would burn a bunch of incense and meditate in my car. Uh, I want, since I mentioned incense, um, get you the different scents, different kinds of incense. Um, I use incense to get me in that state also. Uh, I get in my car, roll up all the windows and fire up two, three incense and keep all that smoke in there. I might crack the window a little bit. Right, but it will put you in a state. Incense is something that's a uh, sensory thing. It will trigger it. But um, once you get over the the initial, if you're if you're new to it, go play, have fun, figure out what you can do, figure out what you need to work on so you can do it better, things like that. But once you get it down, you should not go into a state of meditation without something to do something you want to know you should go for a specific purpose i went into meditation to set up forever altars to different deities i went in to uh i've left copies i've left etheric and astral copies of myself in meditation doing a specific work i went in to check on it to conversate with them to see how it was going what's the progress 
um, any question you want an answer to, uh, anything you want to verify, you can verify information in meditation. A lot of times you might not get the answer in meditation, but you will find the answer in your so-called waking world. So I said I'm going to keep this short. I'm trying to think of what more I can drop uh, for the advanced. I will, uh, for those who are tried and true, you might want to, if you're in the habit of meditating with your eyes closed, change it up, meditate with your eyes open. Now, that's kind of hard when like you're in a room, it's lights on, everything's going around you. But, but believe it or not, the same thing applies. You can put yourself in that state, eyes open. And literally, when I do it, everything shuts off in stages. First thing to go is my sensory objects, my sense of feeling, hearing. And even though your eyes are wide open, even your sight will go because you're now looking inward. Uh, you can also do uh, eyes open meditations in complete darkness. And trust me, these are different. If you're normally eyes closed, that's going to be different. Now, there are those who, who are normally eyes open. So I suggest the same because it will have a different effect. It will hit differently. And, and for those who are struggling with dream recall, the act of meditation will kick in your dream recall especially if you treat meditation like it's a dream. So having said that, we read, I don't know what made me go on that tangent, but I'm glad I did. Because like I said, I was going to do this earlier and I said no, so I'm glad I did. So next, let me go to Susanna. I haven't read her book in a few weeks. This is uh, Z's Easy to Row by Susanna E. Budapest. This is like a book of like, different rituals in terms of the tarot cards and so let's see what she has to say about the hermeticus she says the hermit this is a virgo card and should have a woman picture spiritual guidance from within manifested in attractions and repulsions go with the inner force heavy heavy dreams when this card comes analysis, creativity, insights, leadership, the effects can last a long time. Uh, I used to knock this book when I first got it, but uh, no lies detected. This card is indeed connected to Virgo, like I said, Virgo number nine. Um, I know for a fact that every one of these cards, when, when, when contemplated and analyzed, uh, it will affect the dreams. Let's go to my arch nemesis, Arthur Edward Waite, the pictorial key to the tarot. Let's see what Mr. Waite, I should have a highlighter here. So let's see what he says about the hermit. The variation from the conventional models in this card is only that the lamp is not enveloped partially in the mantle of its bearer. Oh, so normally the mantle is partially covering the lamp, huh? Who blends the idea of the Ancient of Days, which is like the Demiurge, Jehovah, with the light of the world. It is a star which shines in the latter. I have said that this is a card of attainment. And to extend this conception, the figure is seen holding up his beacon on an eminence. I don't know what that means. And to extend this conception, the figure is seen holding up his beacon on an eminence. Therefore, the hermit is not, as Court de Giblin explained, a wise man in search of truth and justice, nor is he, as a later explanation proposes, an especial example of experience. His beacon intimates that where I am, you also may be. Hmm. It is further a card which is understood quite incorrectly when it is connected with the idea of a coat isolation as the protection of personal magnetism against admixture. So this is addressing the idea that to as a lot of occultists have that they have to withdraw in order to uh, cultivate that that magnetism, that magic, which really you don't. Well, addressing what I was just saying about the act of meditation. You can learn to cut off these senses and to, to be, get focused and become, uh, get that, that laser 
that laser beam focus. You can you can you can phase everything out. Um, sound, sight, touch, smell. You can zone it all out. So the act of uh, seclusion does not necessarily require that you go up into the mountains or give away all your earthly possessions, which I'm assuming is what he's saying. This is one of the frivolous renderings which we owe to live as lead. It has been adopted by the French order of Martinism, and some of us have heard a great deal of the silent and unknown philosophy enveloped by its mantle from the knowledge of the profane. In true Martinism, the significance of the term philosophy in Kanui was of another order. It did not refer to the intended concealment of the ins ins instituted mysteries, much less of their substitutes, but like the card itself, to the truth that the divine mysteries were secure of their own protection from those who were unprepared. Now he's actually contradicting himself to some, to some degree. He's saying that the uh, the concealment of the of the instituted mysteries. Uh, he was talking about um, the concealment of the mysteries, the secrecy. How he puts blinds in, and he's obligated not to say certain things. Uh, He's saying that um, that the truth that to the truth that divine mysteries secure their own protection from those who were unprepared. So what he's saying is there's really not a severe need for secrecy, right? That's the that's the, the obligation oath that humans place upon themselves and others in these in these groups. What he's saying is there really isn't any need for that if somebody's not ready. They're just not ready. And if you think about it, I said that at the beginning of this video when I spoke on these binaural beats I'm listening to. Uh, a lot of people, meditation, Satan, satanic meditation, you see that they're going to bar themselves from whatever comes behind it and miss out on some mom ass binaural beats just because it has the word Satan in the front. So, even though you didn't really discuss the card, my nigga, while you're talking about uh, you ain't got to worry about it. You see how he was slick. He just threw lugs at uh, a live his levy, but he didn't even break down the card. You go give me a highlighter. I'll be right back. Marcus Aurelius. All right, let's get down to the good part. Uh, Paul Foster case. So this is, uh, no, I'm going to delay this um, orgasmic feeling. We're going to go to Barbara G. Walker, The Secrets of, of the Tarot Origins, History, and Symbolism. Let's go to the number nine card. We have here the hermit. Now, in her image, we talked about the caduceus. In her image, it is a wise old man with a beard. He's holding a lantern. Um, but he has the caduceus. Let me see if I can get that in there if you can see it at all. Um, well, we can. So you see here, he has a staff of hermit and caduceus. Remember, we saw that we read that in um. J.C. Cooper, an illustrated encyclopedia symbol. So let's read what Barbara G. Walker has to say about the hermit card, number nine. Tantric tradition taught that the secular life of marriage and worldly affairs, rehashta, re should be followed by a compensatory life of seclusion and meditation. Uh, Vana prasta. Now, now, I have to say this. I'd be remiss if I didn't say it. Barbara G. Walker's of the understanding in terms of tarot symbology that the chariot, the chariot is followed by strength, which is followed by the hermit. If I'm correct. Yeah. So she believes that 789. Now, for her, 
she didn't have at number eight, she doesn't have strength, she has justice. So it implies that after conquering all materiality, because the chariot car actually crossed the abyss from uh, from Gebera to Bina or from Mars to Saturn. So since you've crossed this abyss, you've, you've uh, let me close this door. What the hell's going on? I don't hear no music. Oh, I got low on me. So, so what she says is that after you cross, after you cross the abyss in the chariot, you, you've conquered all the materiality, right? She says that now justice comes into play and you have to basically uh, pay your pint of blood, right? And then after uh, the justice, the weighing of the scales and being found wanting, from there you would go into seclusion. You would give away all of your earthly possessions or basically the act of giving away possessions represents the removal of ego. So she says, uh, during the latter period, a wise man must confront the concept of oncoming death and meet the spirits who would eventually take his soul on his fatal journey. Greek Orphics taught the same doctrine. From their little Hermes came the word hermit. For Hermes was the spirit who conducted men's souls to their proper resting places. Those who were properly taught and meditated on the right mysteries would become like the God himself and would be welcomed by Persephone to the seats of the hallowed. Christians had much the same notion of a holy hermit's shortcut to heaven, though they substituted a seat at the right hand of God for the one offered by Persephone. Now, remember I was saying that there's a clear connection between this car and Jupiter and also between uh, the magician, which is Mercury, Hold. And uh, she's, she's speaking on that. The mere fact that in other, other decks, the hermit staff was the, the caduceus, the winged caduceus, uh, which connects this car to the fool car. I think that's pretty dope. I think that would also suggest that the seclusion is one of mental aspects because uh, Mercury escorting the dead to the underworld. He's essentially guiding you to your subconscious, to the sweet parts, to the good parts of, of yourself, to that hidden, those treasures buried in darkness within yourself. Um, the Tarot Hermit always seemed to be starting a journey in the opposite direction to that of the fool. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Because the fool is heading towards consciousness. He's uh, spirit descending into matter. So the hermit, whereas the fool is coming down into materiality, the hermit is going within. His journey is to return from there back whence he came, right? Like Hermes, he carried a staff, sometimes in the form of a hermetic caduceus. Often he was led by the Hermetic Serpent, number ninth in the Major Arcana, the crucial number of the muses who gave interpretation. Oh. So all, all correspondences of nine, not all, but the muses, divine inspiration, right? Um, and poised to enter the second lunar sphere. The hermit seemed to be a starting journey into the inner world of the unconscious and the mystical. His, numer his numer numerological counterpart, the goddess of strength, Trump number 11, stood for the inner strength of the solitary seeker after his own idea. And she emphasized the word I. She put I hyphen D-E-A. Oh, idea. Dia means deity, God. That caught me slipping. I didn't realize the idea can be broken down in that math. Dia, day, deity. I go get it. 
literally the inner goddess, a classical term for the Shakti. It has always been the custom of seers, sages, shamans, saviors, mages, prophets, and other holy men to spend some time in solitude, preferably in the wilderness. Wilderness, forest, it always represents the soul uh, or the mind, but more so the soul. Uh, wilderness in, in, in particular because wilderness long, long ago was, was synonymous with unknown dangers. And most are unaware of their soul or their inner being, right? One second. Miss Carl's. Okay. So let's go back. It has always been the custom of seers, sages, shamans, saviors, mages, prophets, and other holy men to spend some time in solitude, preferably in a wilderness, a wilderness, often in a pit or cave, symbolizing the womb of spiritual rebirth. Religious and mythical symbolism has countless images for introversion, e.g., dying, going down, subterranean crypts, vaults, dark temples into the underworld, hell, the sea, etc. Being swallowed by a monster or fish as Jonah, stay in the wilderness, etc. So I actually had a synchronicity prior to even diving into the hermit card. It's like some part of me, probably in the past life most likely, is already aware of the sequence of cards. And, and so the fact that I woke up with thoughts of uh, doing doing a, a YouTube on meditation to see it's quite applicable to this card. Like I said, the synchronicities, they fall so so rapidly and so regularly that uh, normally, normally I don't even stop to tip my hat at them. I just carry on and I adjust accordingly. Uh, but this, there's, this Tarot series has been exceptional in more ways than one for me. The main way is that it has taught me to have more faith in myself, even in the things that I do not know. And that's amazing. Uh, it says here, Jung noted that there may be a sound psychological reason, there may be sound psychological reasons for such isolation and inversion. It results as a rule in the animation of the psychic atmosphere as a substitute for loss of contact with other people. It causes an activation of the unconscious. Now, I'll share something else that does the same thing and does not require you to remove yourself from society and will give you just as much power in return. And that is going on a speaking fast. You heard it right. Now, this is something that I did in my early 20s. Yeah, early 20s. Uh between 21 and 25 around there now this is uh one of the most extreme forms of discipline especially when we live in this time where uh it's just so busy so active you know uh how can you uh but then i think about it it's actually some some Good ways to get around. I'm about to say, how can you go to the store and, and order your food without speaking to somebody? You say you want to go get you a burger. You go to, you go wherever, order you a burger. So it's like, how would you do that without speaking? Well, the way I did this back then, because of course this was the 90s, right? Um, I carried a small notebook and I would write down anything I wanted to say to anybody. It would slow their game down, stop them from just talking you to death. And you smile. Then you flip the page over for them to write whatever they want to say. Uh, you will be surprised. Now, I would say this. If you're contemplating going on speaking fast, start off small. Work up big. By small, don't, don't start off saying, I'm going to go a day. Start off with just, especially if you're a talker, start off with an hour or two. 
And don't pick an hour when you're normally not around people. You pick an hour when you're going to be around people and they have to get comfortable with this concept. And what you do is the very first page in your tablet, you can tear the other ones out daily. But that very first page has to be a statement explaining why you're not speaking because otherwise you're going to get asked this constantly. So the very first page is, I am on a one hour speaking fast. What can I do for you? How can I help you? They tell you, you write it down, you let them read it. If they want to write something or if they want to say it, say it, you respond. Uh, after a day, you once you can go a full 24 hours, you will notice that the nature of everything around you changes. Your consciousness, uh, your thoughts, you, your mind, the, the chatter in your head will actually drop to a low hum. If you are, if you have that still, uh, it's, it's on the levels of uh, semen retention. The longer you go, the, the more results you see. And it's another thing that you have to be careful of because you will get addicted to it. Um, even Christian Gospels recorded a period of aesthetic isolation for both John the Baptist and Jesus, both of whom scholars believe belong to an ascetic cult. Ex extended meditation in the wilderness was an initiatory rule among the Essenes, who also had in each of their groups a functionary called Christ or teacher of righteousness, trained to bear painful punishments in the role of the scapegoat for the sins of others. Eastern yoga also trained themselves to bear physical trials such as hunger, thirst, and bodily immobility, or even mutilation to overcome physical desires and heighten inner awareness. Now, I, 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 when I hear that, I think most for the uh, Indian, the Hindu, those, those monks, not even Hindu, I would say Tibetan, those priests, those monks, who mastered uh, lowering their heartbeat, slowing down their breathing. Uh, there was the one guy, uh, he did something where like he didn't use one hand, didn't use one arm for like years or something. Eventually that sucker atrophied. Um, but though that's a form of discipline, believe it or not, a form of, of meditation and discipline, self-discipline. Um, let's go back. Where was I? Eastern yogis also train themselves to bear physical traits such as hunger, thirst, and bodily immobility, even even mutilation, to overcome physical desires and heighten inner awareness. Now, I say this in terms of meditation, and anybody that meditates knows this. I don't care how often you meditate, you're you will constantly get that itch, that scratch, that desire to open your eyes and think about something. Um, a lot of people attribute this to ego and, oh, my lower self don't want me to connect with my higher self. Actually, this is a totally physical body trait. This is something you've trained yourself to do over decades. Your body, especially in terms of the itches, <clears throat> your body is trying to check and see if you're asleep. If you scratch, oh, we're woke. If you don't scratch, oh, we're asleep. The, the faster you learn to ignore those itches and scratches, the faster you will drop into a meditative state. You go get me another water. I'll be right back. He's got whack. Like I said, man, he removed a bunch of the good ones, man. What's next? This is peaceful despair. Miss me. What's next? What's this one? When I 
that's it. Oh no, next one. Let's see what is this. Beals above and them that are with him shoot arrows. Yeah, he removed the good ones. Got me wanting to go back to uh, Ganesh, but the 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 synchronicities have all pointed towards this, so I'm gonna ride it out. Busy day today. I'm actually supposed to be studying. But I figure at most I'll be doing this another hour, hour and a half. Okay. Um, says here, uh, Eastern yogis also train themselves to bear physical traits such as hunger, thirst, and bodily immobility, or even mutilation to overcome physical desires and heighten inner awareness. They often use techniques of controlled breathing, as is still suggested by the word inspiration, inspiration, it's all involved in breath, literally breathing in a spirit. Having the spirit within was known to the Greeks as in into seismos divinity within a kind of possession of course when the christian church ruled that all the old gods who used to cause intonasia it in were demons then the same inspiration was viewed as demonic possession root in was still common in the in the present century amongst such groups as the shakers or holy rollers camp meeting frenzies or the ceremonies of voodoo i never thought of those especially voodoo those group sessions as group meditations but here they are man where the buy no beats at oh my word hour it is i'm gonna be patient uh, i like the other ones better man just be leaning with it, rocking with it. Uh, okay. Sorry about that. The Tarot Hermit was often identified as the Diogenes. Diogenes, D I O G N E S, a famous yogi type of sage who lived in a large earthen pot at the door of the Great Mother's Temple. With this lantern, it was said, Diogenes constantly searched for one honest man. The real reason for his search was seldom included in the Greek legend. His, his sectaries, the cynics, taught that the end of the world would come when there was not one honest man left among the living. As long as one honest man yet remained, doomsday might be postponed. There are indications that the Essenes taught the same doctrine. I'm gonna highlight that for a different reason. That's a movie. That could be a movie. Lately, I've been seeing movie plots in my mind, and so I gotta, I gotta write that. I gotta follow that rabbit down the soul. And of course, I would have an ink pen that doesn't write. Yeah, not that ish. In Greeks, in Greece, the hermits of Hermes were said to practice ritual masturbation, which Hermes invented as another technique of self-contemplation in search of the God within the self. Ha! <laughs> Who'd have thought that masturbation is the meditation technique? But I guess so. Because I can speak from personal experience that uh, the mind is the most powerfully erotic tool. You don't need you you, don't, you you might think you need to watch a porn or look at a magazine or something, but close your eyes and uh, you will find yourself there. Yes, you will. So no, that's not a surprise. Um, similarly in India. Many autoerotic practices were attributed to Krishna as the god of self-love. Pagans and Orientals often believed that masturbation purified the body as opposed to the Christian view that it was a sin and a pollution. 
Some scholars accordingly interpreted the hermetic caduceus as a phallic symbol of masturbation, the almost inevitable practice of any solitary man. I was just trying to wonder, like, where is this going? But I get it, though. And also to link this meaning with the, the, the tarot hermit. Well, he does have that erect staff in his hand. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I guess it can be implied. Uh, at times, the sage's autoeroticism was supposed to represent sacred marriage with his spirit wife or Shakti, a sexual union with his own soul or with his goddess. The reason most commonly advanced for a sage's celibate life was that having tasted the love of a goddess, he was forever unable to enjoy the lesser charms of ordinary women. Because why else would a man deny himself the pleasure of a woman, right? This notion too was repeated in Christian tradition. Monks claimed to make themselves bridegrooms of the Virgin Mary by giving a wedding ring to her image, just as the Cyprian priest Pygmalion married the statue of Aphrodite Galata. So Brenton Blackfriars continued to marry the Queen of Heaven up to the late 15th century. Brother Alan de la Roche described his own wedding with Mary being before a crowd of angels. She presented him with the ring made of her own hair. Christian female ascetics were styled brides of Christ because the nuns copied the Roman Vestal virgins who were amate, loved ones of the masculine spirit of Rome embodied in the Pria, Priapic Palladium. Priapic being Priapus, erect phallus, unending, an unending erection uh, in the Priya, Priya Pic Palladium. There are a number of ways sexuality and spirituality have always been more closely related than patriarchal religions would like to admit. And that's true. Uh, there does reach a point when you realize that a lot of magical, a lot of magical working center around uh, sexual energies, which is why you see a lot of these cults that get that misinterpret this and they start basically just sex clubs. Um, but things like semen retention, meditation, uh, prolonging orgasm, uh, I share a fact. I used to write sigils on my junk in honey to activate and power my get downs. Yeah. Uh, it's just different ways. You can be as creative as you want. The thing is to find balance. I don't let this cat out hear me out. Maybe yeah, come out and join the society. All right, so let's get back to it. Um, in a number of ways, sexuality and spirituality has always been more closely related than patriarchal religion would like to admit. On hearing the confessions of nuns who claim to have copulated with Christ, priests sometimes inconsistently declare such women demon possessed. But sometimes, but in view of the church's own teachings, the premise was the premise was logical enough. Spirit wives of tantric sages were supposed to come from the ranks of the Dakinis in the in the intermediate state. These death angels could be beautiful fairies who gently carried their lovers into heavenly bliss or they could be fearsome, devouring succubi. The tantric bardo Toto displayed a remarkable flash of insight by saying all the spirits of death, all the spirits of the death world are one's own mental projections. Let the church say amen. May I recognize whatever appeareth as being mine own thought forms. May I know them to be apparitions of the intermediate state. Fear not the bands of the peaceful and wrathful. 
who are thine own thought forms? That, that is a very powerful insight. I'm going to highlight that. Like that. Okay. So if the hermit seemed about to plunge into the netherworld of the unconscious, he was certain to encounter many of his own thought forms, even if they had hid behind conventionalized symbolism. The freedom of interpretation allowed by tarot symbols left plenty of room for the preverbal mythographic language of any individual to make its own statement. Some have claimed that this is the whole secret of the tarot, like contemplation in the wilderness hermit hermitage. Solitary contemplation of the tarot could lead to new kinds of insight. True that, true that, true that. Now let's move on to my guy, my mans and them, Paul Foster Case, the Tarot, a key to the wisdom of ages. Now with his book, that's the Yod. With his book, I'm gonna go straight to this see chapter two. He has all the breakdowns and the numbers. Let's go to the number nine. So it says here nine. Contemplation, attainment, fulfillment, the goal of endeavor, the end of a cycle of activity. Yet, because eight indicates rhythm as part of the creative process, completion is not absolute cessation. The end of one cycle is the beginning of another. This is the the basis of all practical occultism. Nobody ever comes to the end of his tether. Nobody ever reaches a point where nothing more remains to be hoped for, where nothing remains to be accomplished. Everything, every end is the seed of a fresh beginning. In Kabbalah, therefore, nine is called basis or foundation. Yeah, because nine is Yesod, which is the foundation. Um, and corresponds to the mode of consciousness named pure or clear intelligence because the completion of any process is, is the pure, clear, unadulterated expression of the intention or idea which initiated the process. When I think of nine, I think of nine months in the womb, which is the completion of a process. And it doesn't signify an end. It, it signifies the end of that incubation and the beginning of this next stage in life. And this is what gives hope, not even hope. This is where the fact remains that death only implies a rebirth somewhere else. So let's get to uh, Dr. Paul Foster Case and what he has to say about the Hermit card. But like I said, out the gate, I noticed that his skull cap on the left, we're talking about the bolted deck, is the yod. The yod is, I believe, a phallic symbol. I'm not certain, but I believe it's a phallic symbol. Let's see. Yod, value 10, means the hand of man. It is the open hand in contradistinction of kaf, the closed hand, which follows it in the alphabet. Yod indicates power, means, direction, skill, dexterity but it is the sign rather of tendency, aptitude, inclination, predisposition or potency than of actual activity. It means you're about to. I'm getting the itches like I'm in meditation. My body actually probably thinks, man, we must be dreaming right now because all we do is read fucking books up and sleep. Probably in a sense. Ooh, this is getting good. I'm sorry for dragging this out, but it's getting good. Ooh, broke my window. My stomach is broken. Why? 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 Why?
YG four hundred. All right, let's do it. Um, so he was saying it basically represents uh the potential, the possibility for activity. It's not so much the doing; it's the, it's more of uh in terms of Kabbalah, I would say it's more Catholic as opposed to Hopma. It's more potentiality. It's more, it's more possibility as the actual doing. Um, but it's a sign, uh, but it is, let me see. Um, in the religious symbolism of the world, the open hand is everywhere and at all times a type of be be beneficence and of the freedom of the Supreme Spirit. Oh, that would be the Jupiter. The, that's that effect, that's that expansion. I would say, I could be wrong. In the Kabbalah, this letter has a special, a special importance because it is the initial letter of the Tetragrammaton, yod heh vav -Hey, and the initial letter also of the word Yekaida, the term used in the wisdom of Israel to de designate the indivisible one, the supreme self, having the abode or seat in Kether, the crown, at the top of the tree of life. I said it was Ketheric, so I'm glad I got that confirmation out the gate. Kabbalists, moreover, say that the upper point of the letter refers to Kether, the primal wheel, while the body of the letter represents the second sephirah, chokmah, or wisdom. The sense of touch is that which is attributed to Yod, and the same letter in Kabbalah corresponds to the function of koishin, koishin, C-O-I-T-I-O-N, in which the sense of touch is particularly active. Koishin, it's close to koitus. Esoterically, the letter Yo corresponds to the experience of union with the Supreme Self, the true I am of the cosmos. This is confirming the meditation aspect. This experience, intensely blissful, is often compared by cult writers, both ancient and modern, to the intense physical ecstasy of the sex embrace. Prudes may quarrel with this comparison. Let them read the Song of Solomon, the mystical poem, poetry of Persian Sufis, or some of the narratives of Christian mystical experience, and they will learn that some of the best minds the human race has ever produced have not, have not scruples to employ. Intensely exotic imagery in their endeavors to describe the bliss of union with the one. So he said any sexual experience is not, does not even come close to comparing with this, this com combination. It says uh, north below is the direction attributed by Kabbalists to Yo on the cube of space. It is the lower boundary of the northern face and the northern boundary of the lower face. It joins the lower ends of the vertical lines, northeast, the emperor, and northwest, justice. One reason for this attribution is that the destruction of error symbolized by key 16, north, is one of the elements of mystic experience. This is a book you have to get because in the front he has this chart, which is the cube of space, and he shows where all of these major arcana are, on there, I'm trying to find it now myself. It came up fast. The first few pages, I believe.
Oh, I think it was one in the book. Here it is. That's like a cubic space. Got to be between 16 and 21. What? No, I'm not sure. Well, clearly I am. I can't find the cue. I don't know what's in here. Let me see, I haven't put a cube up. I have a picture of it. I didn't want to put it up. But I should be able to get all three up here. Come here, Cubie, 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 Cubie. Where are you at, Cubie? And I'll read this again, and it'll actually make more sense. No, not that. That is that it? Nope. What the hell is the cube, man? Wow, maybe I deleted it. Because I clearly do not see it. This is it, I doubt it, nope. There we go. There's the cube. Let's enlarge the sucker. I can't enlarge it, all right, that's good enough. You can see it up there. So I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna read where he says it is. So north below, that's east, west. Southeast, so north below, northeast, that's the tower. Man, I wish I had my, what the hell is my picture, man? That creeping in my window. Uh, I'm going to do, I'm going to have to take these other two off. And then we better blow this sucker up. Okay, there we go. So, north below, look at the bottom of the screen. There's nine north below Hermit, and that, that intersects with. Uh, East below the chariot and the emperor. Now this is uh these cars. This is actually like a diagram of consciousness, time, and it's applied to uh, the major account. So let's read it again. He says, "North below, which is right there, number nine." is a direction attributed by Kabbalists to Yo on the cube of space. It is the lower boundary of the northern face and the northern boundary of the lower face. It joins the lower ends of the vertical lines, northeast, the emperor, and northwest, justice. Oh, so it doesn't bind with the, with the chariot, which it should. Well, it bisects with the chariot. But you see 11, 9, and uh, four, the emperor. Yeah, the emperor and justice. One reason for this attribution is that the destruction of error symbolized by key 16, key 16 is, after the devil card, right? Devil's 15. Oh, boy. 
Oh, the tower card. Um, one reason for this attribution is that the destruction of air is symbolized by key 16 north. Oh, okay. Is one of the elements of mystic experience. Furthermore, the experience depends on certain transformations of the Mars force and the physical body. And these transformations are affected by subconsciousness below. Again, mystic experience is a supreme expression of the subconscious process of memory and association. High priestess below. See the high priestess below. Subconscious. When we most perfectly remember ourselves, we experience this blissful merging of personal consciousness with the universal. The color assigned to Virgo is yellow green. Its musical tone is F natural. So I can bring the cars back up. Back over here. Okay. Um, Virgo, the virgin, immutable or common earthly sign is attributed to the letter Yo. It is ruled by Mercury, key one, the magician. And it's also the sign in which Mercury is exalted. Virgo is dominated, therefore, by self-conscious initiative and represents the state in which the highest manifestation of self-consciousness is experienced in Virgo. Mm. This is this state is what the Bible calls heaven. Therefore, Jesus said that in heaven there is neither marriage nor giving in marriage, because in the blissful state of union there is no sense of otherness or separation. This corresponds to the idea of virginity connected with the sign. And in, in the state of consciousness, we are now considering all distinctions are separate, are of separate personality. And consequently, all distinctions of sex are completely obliterated. I'm thinking now, this is possibly the lug that Wait was shooting at Life is Levy. The implication of solitary loving, masturbation, most likely. And uh, what we just read, you know, if you uh, reach this state, um, you know, you essentially find yourself, you know, married to the game, for lack of a better term. And so, uh, very interesting. Uh, how Virgo the Virgin is a topic that book after book after book is correlating it to sex. So we know that this is not a physical sex. This is a, a psychological or spiritual sex, for lack of an overused term, which would be the, the act of impregnating yourself with right thoughts, ideas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Ooh, excuse me. Astrologers say Virgo rules the intestines where digestion is completed and where the final selection is made between assimil assimilable material and what is rejected as waste. In certain forms of occult practice concealed under veils of alchemy, the assimilation of solar energy. Ah, oh, man, just messed me up. So the board were. The Borg and Star Trek, they were assimilators, right? They were actually an act of alchemy. Mm. And it says the assimilation of solar energy from food by the lactils. Come on, my neck. Come on, my neck. It ain't that good. I'm getting hungry. I still got a couple more books to read, huh?
might turn this into a part two. I'm getting hungry. I'll finish this chapter and turn this into a part two. But when I come back for the part two, we're going to kick it off with this again because it's been a lot to digest in this. And so today is Friday, it's what, 11 something. Um, I should be able to get down. Not tonight. Tomorrow. Okay, so that's all I do. A few more pages in this. I'm gonna go read. I know it's only been an hour and some change, I think. Maybe close to two hours. Okay. So astrologers say Virgo rules the intestines where digestion is completed and where the final selection is made between the assimilable material and what is rejected as waste. In certain forms of occult practice concealed under the veils of alchemy, the assimilation of solar energy from, the, from food by lacteals in the small intestines is, is tremendously increased. In certain forms of occult practice concealed under the veils of alchemy, the assimilation of solar energy from food by the lacteals. What are lacteals? Black. Says lacteal, the lymphatic vessel of the small intestines which absorb digestive fats. There's a coat practice where you absorb sunlight by your lacteals in the small intestines, and it's tremendously increased. To this practice, we may refer out to, and, and th to this practice, we may refer our chemical references to the first matter as a virgin's milk. Prepared under the regimen of mercury to the process of putrefication, symbolized by a black dragon, the convolution of the intestines and the darkness of the abdominal, abdominal cavity, and to the fact that it is the visible aspect, the first matter is a thing accounted by all men to be the vilest thing on earth. Well, that fucked me up. On more levels than one. Um, I don't know about others, but I find myself at times, especially when I find myself on a plateau, not where I'm actually rising, but where I'm sitting back and reflecting on what I've learned and the work that I've put in and, you know, how do I assimilate it? How do I fit it into who I am? Uh, there usually is a call for me to discard something at this point. But I also in the in the process of questioning what I've learned and what I think I know, I always wonder like uh, not always, but it comes up every so often. Just what is what is the purpose of it, you know? And and I wonder to myself like, you know, um, is it possible that? On some level, I'm like, you know, chasing the rabbit down a hole that really has no end and has no real purpose. Now, I'm, the mere fact that I'm sitting there doing this, I get my answer every time. But one of the most simplistic answers is that all of these practices, we've heard the statement as above, so below. And all of these practices serve to mimic and mirror cosmic events and processes when i say cosmic i mean like the revolution of planets uh uh the uh the composition of stars the the um the progression of seasons and days and calendar keeping and equinoxes and things of that nature right and they are also and when I say these things, I'm talking about like gods and goddesses, uh, these mythologies we've been handed. 
They mirror cosmic events. They also mirror bodily events. And so reading this, um, I, I, I put it in my book. I understand that like the dragon, the knight fighting the dragon, the, the your bowels are considered a dragon, you know? And, um, you know, so uh, to read this and see that they consider that the intestines to be a dragon, black is, of course, would be the voodoo. And it's production of the first matter is a thing, you know, so yeah. I don't know why this has me kind of like having an oh wow moment, but I'm going to highlight this to make sure that I come back to it either tonight or tomorrow. And I'm pretty sure he's dropping something on different layers too. I want somebody doing some boo boo rituals, you know? Not me, man. But for the most part, I make my mind my laboratory. Although I will use my body. And when I say use my body, that would be uh, like taking the herbs and stuff like that, uh, denying myself certain things, giving myself certain things, breathing techniques and things like that. But for the most part, I weigh everything uh, on the balance scales of, in my mind. Um, any rituals, I usually do it first in my mind to see the outcome and things like that. Intelligence of will is the mode of consciousness attributed to the letter Yo, said the Kabbalist. It, it prepares all created beings, each individually, for the demonstration of the existence of the primordial glory. This demonstration is the experience hitherto described. The primordial glory is that of the Supreme Self. The word translated above as will means primarily the light and has for supplementary, supplementary meanings, pleasure, intent, purpose, determination. Thus, we find that all description of mystic experience agree that it is firsthand knowledge of an ineffable glory, of an unspeakable bliss, and of intensely, of an intensely certain and definite, what? And of an intensely certain and definite though incommunicable knowledge of the meaning and tendency of the cosmic life process. In this experience, the question, what is this all about, is settled once and for all. Wow. Then I just sit here and kind of struggle with uh, putting the words, what is this all about? It's settled once for all. In it, too, the knowledge that there can be but one free will in the universe of which free will, all things and creatures are, are personal expressions in, in a knowledge established forever. The hermit is a I'm reading it, so I'm not gonna highlight it just yet. The hermit is a title referring to a passage in the Kabbalah which says Yod is above all, symbolizing the father, and with him is none other associated. A hermit lives alone in isolation. The picture shows him alone standing on a snowy mountain peak far above the climbing travelers for whom he holds aloft his lantern as a beacon. I knew that he wasn't holding that lantern up for himself. I didn't say it, but I knew it wasn't for him because he has his, he has his, he's already within and he has his staff in his hand. So he's lighting the way for others, possibly for the other fools, right? Uh, his white beard shows that he is the most holy ancient one identified with the primal will. His gray cow robe suggests another Kabbalistic title for the one concealed with all concealment. Uh, wow, sir. He is the source of all, yet is he also the goal of all endeavor. 
every practice in the cult training aims at the union of personal consciousness with the cosmic will, which is the causeless cause of all particular manifestations. At first, it may puzzle you to account for the fact that a letter assigned to the direction north below should be symbolized by a man standing on a height. Remember the axiom, that which is above is as that which is below. Remember also that such words as cause, source, origin, etc., are revealed to that which is basic, fundamental, and therefore at the bottom of all things. Now, what this makes me think of is in Lord of the Rings when uh, in the first Lord of the Rings when they were going, they were going to cut through the um, the mines, the old elf mines. And Gandalf got into it with uh, I forget the demon's name now. And you shall not pause. But if you remember, they fell. Him and that demon fell, battling. Boom. Uh, ah. Remember, he was Gandalf the Grey eventually. Well, no, he was Gandalf the Grey when he fell and went into that isolation on his own. Matter of fact, he, matter of fact, from that isolation. He came back as more powerful. So much so he almost forgot himself. Anyway, they were falling down, uh, battling. And in the end, what did he say? I smoked his ruins on the mount of whatever. But he had went down so low, but still found himself on the top of a snowy mountain. Hermit action. All right. On that note, I'm stopping right chill. We're going to come back and get to it. So, I'm going to say this. Thank you for your time. Thank you for indulging me, sharing this with me. If you haven't already, like, subscribe, share, Code Topics with the Professor, but also get you a copy of this right here. The occult mean and masonry and symbols in the chakra system by the professor. You can get that by going to www.pillarbookpublishing.com. Find me on Instagram. I am who I think I am. You can find me on Facebook, Michael Dale, and we can get into something that's going to do something. All right. Thank you so much again for your time. And um, hopefully we'll be getting back to this later. I got a lot, I got some studying to do outside of this, and I'm hungry, so I'm gonna get to it. So having said that again, thank you, thank you, thank you, and peace.